Hey folks, uh, we are starting the third week, and uh, with this week and probably for the next several, maybe even maybe even the rest of the term, I figure we need to do. I need to give a little lecture, kind of a little explain above and beyond what's in the book. So uh, with this one, as we go through this leadership theory timeline, uh, kind of understanding these these next little uh, at least three weeks of the term. I'm just going to kind of help you out a little bit, but leadership theory timeline. This can kind of go through the the thinking in our field and uh, hopefully give you a little better understanding. So this is really chapter seven. Uh, it's the traits and behaviors section. So let's get going. Okay, the first thing we have to do before we start talking about leadership theory is we have to explain what a theory is. So this is kind of my definition. So a theory is just simply an explanation for how things work. But it's not just an idea or an opinion about something, but it's actually grounded in the scientific method. And so it's formulating hypotheses, it's collecting data, it's running appropriate and valid statistical or whatever uh, data analysis techniques. And then you get your results and you compare it with predefined decision rules uh, to the hypotheses. And then from that, you can uh, reject or not reject a null. And then you can replicate it and do some additional studies. So theory. So this is leadership theory that we're going to be studying. So leadership has been around as long as people have been around. You go back and look at the pyramids, you look at things that have been built, you look at uh, uh, these ancient burial mounds, you read of stories of great battles. So as long as people have been around working in groups, leadership's been around and teamwork and organization. But as far as the formal study of leadership and using the scientific method to come up with some ideas and thoughts and real explanations for how things work, it's really about a hundred, little over a hundred years old. So, so that's what we're going to focus on uh, for the next several weeks is where has our thinking come from um, and then and then kind of where we are now and maybe where, where we're going in the future. I think as you see these theories, the new ones that come on top of them do not, you know, just blow the old ones away. They just kind of rest on top of it. So we get kind of a better, more complete understanding as we go. So again, definition of the theory. So let's look at this one real quick. So the first one. The first one, the formal study of leadership, we were kind of taught uh, that it all really kind of began in World War I. So with World War I, we have this big war raging in Europe and in the United States, we need to put together uh, a military, an army uh, to go over and aid in the war efforts. And so the United States at that time had a lot of immigrants coming in, had a lot of people who were getting mobilized. And what we needed to do was figure out who were gonna be the officers and who are going to be the enlisted. So who in all these people has leadership potential, command potential, management potential, and who are the ones that need to be more of the enlist on the enlisted side? And so they had to come up with a way to identify who those people were. And so what they did, now this used to be called the great man theories. Sorry, ladies, we've, we've developed uh, trait theories is what this was. So what they did to start from scratch, since they really didn't have a whole lot uh, to go off of, they basically studied effective military leaders. They went out and looked at them and they recorded their traits, uh, different characteristics of those people. And then they came up with a big list. And then uh, once they had the list kind of on the clipboard as people would come in, they could evaluate. This kind of goes back to that one of those first presentations, that prototypical model that's in someone's head. They came up with the list of traits and characteristics, and then they could hold those traits and characteristics up next to these people. And basically, if the person matched those traits and characteristics, we would say that they're probably going to be a leader. But if they don't match the traits and characteristics, then they're probably not. And so we have another option for them. So really this goes almost right back uh, to the whole veggie tales and the pig and dog and uh, forming these different categories in your head. So, but that was trait theory. And here's, here's a picture. This is actually my grandfather who I share a name with and I also share a birthday with. He was a second lieutenant uh, in the army uh, at, during World War I, never got shipped overseas. Uh, fortunately, probably for us, uh, the war ended before he was shipped over. But that's the idea of trait theories. So we come up, we, we study the people who are effective, we look at them, we write down their traits, and then when confronted with decisions on whether people are gonna be effective or not, we can compare the people to this list of traits. Now, some of you, I think probably a lot of us in our heads are thinking, well, that's intuitive, but is it really right? So um, from basically World War I until 1948, 47, 48, uh, 
30 years, they, they collected information uh, on different traits for different people, for different leaders. Uh, think about this. So here's just kind of a little thought exercise for you. I, I just typed these up in, in this presentation for you. If you think about an effective elementary school teacher, maybe even a kindergarten teacher, what would those traits be? If, if you were going to look for and describe uh, this kind of prototypical elementary school teacher, probably see caring and nurturing and patient and kind, uh, yet also one who can teach and adapt and encourage the students. Think about a high school coach. So some of those are going to be the same, but some of them are going to be different depending on the team, depending on maybe the level of the team, maybe the level of expectations. Coaches are going to be a little different. Think about going into a military uh, and a drill sergeant and what the drill sergeant is responsible for doing and, and getting people from being civilians uh, to being effective uh, soldiers and sailors and Marines and all the other things. So a drill sergeant. How about the head of a nonprofit organization, the director of a nonprofit? Think about the traits that would be required there. How about for a youth minister or someone who works with youth, uh, maybe a counselor? How about a corporate CEO? So as you go through these, I think we can see that all of them are different. Maybe there are some shared things, but they're all different. And so what happened was we collected, we, the people before us, went out and collected and studied this from basically World War I to the late 40s, looking for the magic, magic list of, of traits and characteristics that would basically guarantee or define an effective leader. And what they found after 30 years Ralph Stogdall at Ohio State University, he's mentioned in the book in this uh, chapter with the Ohio State Studies, and I'll come back to him in a minute. But Ralph Stogdall and his buddies, they did a review piece, and it was published in 47, I think the book came out in 48, uh, where they went back and reviewed and they counted up and looked at all the different traits and characteristics that have been studied and analyzed since World War I to try to come up with that magic list of characteristics that would guarantee finding an effective leader. And what they concluded, these are my own words, uh, they concluded that uh, traits in isolation without an account of the situation give us little clue as to who will be effective or ineffective as a leader. Traits, just simply traits without an account of the situation, the position. Is it, are you talking an elementary school teacher? Are you talking a drill sergeant? Are you talking a military officer? Are you talking a CEO? You have to understand the, the, the situation and the traits by themselves really don't help a whole lot. And I think part of the problem they fell into was the idea of causation versus kind of correlation. So if, with, from your research methods, does one thing then cause the other one to occur or are these two things just related? As one tends to occur, we tend to see this. And so if you go back to the uh, slideshow that I made for the for the Sunday reflection from the second week, I started off with that slide where it has leadership and all those different words on there. And I said, when we see leaders, we tend to see these things. I'm not going to fall into the uh, causation trap, though that's a correlation. So as we see effective leaders, we t tend to see these things. But just because you possess those things doesn't mean you will be an effective leader. Think about a uh, if you had to go out and recruit for an NBA basketball team. You kind of look at the traits of NBA players and you come up with a prototype and then you walk out into the population and you try to find really tall people, really tall, fast, big people, coordinated people. But just because you are really tall and fast and coordinated doesn't mean you will be an effective NBA player. It's just when you see an effective NBA player, you tend to see those things. But just because you possess those things doesn't mean you will be and just because you don't possess those traits doesn't mean you wouldn't be successful. So there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people who have succeeded in the NBA who are not seven feet tall. All right. So that's kind of the idea with trait theory. So in 1948, really kind of ended this, uh, this review piece by Stogdall, Ralph Stogdall, Dr. Ralph Stogdall, really kind of ended the trait theory. We kind of said, eh, we've been looking at this for 30 years. We don't really have any good answers. And we see some flaws and even continuing down this line. So at that stage, we kind of began a new era of uh, leadership theory, again, an explanation for how things work. And this one ushered in the uh, behavioral or behavior theories. And so the first one I want to point out, which is also mentioned in the book, and you can read through there, there were kind of two big ones that began 
uh, back in the 40s and into the 50s. Uh, the first one that I like to mention, I, they're kind of thrown around back and forth in, in our chapter, uh, but I like to do the Michigan one first. And this one was led, interestingly enough, by Dr. Lickert. Not a lot of you are going to think Likert, but you can look it up. Uh, my dissertation chairman and mentor in the PhD program knew this guy. And so he told us from first day, it's Likert. And actually, I was just on the on the web, kind of making sure of that pronunciation. And, and there are other stories of, of people who are friends with the guy as well. Uh, the neat thing about the Likert type scale is that this is something that we now use and take for granted. It's that strongly agree to strongly disagree. Uh, you know, on a seven point scale or a five point scale, it's a way to quantify attitudes. And we brought up attitudes, brought them up with the, the pig and the dog. It's a evaluative belief about something in particular. And so the neat thing about Lickert and his research uh, was that we could quantify an attitude using this scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then we have other types, their attitudinal scales using kind of a similar method, but those are Lickert type scales. So Lickert kind of, a neat thing is now he, he was doing other stuff before he got into the behavioral things, but it's kind of neat knowing that that liquor type scale and the way we measure those attitudes is related back uh, to some leadership research. So on this, what they did is they said, well, it's really not the, the traits, these personality characteristics or actual personal characteristics of these people, but it's, it's the way they interact with their followers and particularly their behaviors. And so they went off and came up with a bunch of things that leaders do, managers do. Uh, sometimes they were just kind of using the idea of manager rather than uh, kind of where we're going with leader, kind of shades of blue ideas, but came up with a list of things that uh, managers or leaders do. And then they surveyed people and they said, tell us about your people. And, and when it was all done with, they kind of broke all those, you know, many, many, many different items, individual items. They then ran some statistical analyses on them. They found they broke out kind of into two groups. You don't, you don't really have as many dimensions as you have questions. You have two dimensions with a lot of different questions that are really addressing those. And so their conclusion was that they're really two. They're, they're those behaviors that are related to interacting with people, greeting them in the morning, making sure that they're doing okay, um, making sure that their personal needs are attended to, uh, their goals are being met, their personal goals. Those would be the employee type things. The production behaviors, these are things about staying on task. Okay, making sure that you're here on time, making sure that you have the resources you need to get the job done, making sure that you understand what the goals, the production goals are. So those types of behaviors that are involved in the job, they called production orientation, those behaviors that are geared toward attending to the personal needs tend to be what, what they call employer orientation. So what they did on this one, and I'm hoping this little pointer's working, I'm sliding it around for you. Uh, they conceptualized this as a single continuum. So let me click over, I kind of made this myself here just a while ago. Uh, University of Michigan, they, the theory, the theory, this is the conceptualization of how this works. So with that figure of 13.3, and you had to dissect uh, the influence of the situation, that, that's the model where we kind of draw out how these ideas we think relate to each other. This is how they drew out these ideas. They did them as opposite ends of a single continuum. So if you think about this, which I'm gonna make you think about, um, if I were really production oriented, I really wanted you to get your work done, I would be out toward this end of the continuum. We can understand that, that, that makes sense. If I were a person who is very in tune and very aware of my people and their needs and their feelings and the ability to set them up for success and to reinforce their uh, work and just everything that they do, I would be on this end of the continuum. So my question is, what about someone who's really good at both? They're able to get the job done and keep the people focused on the task, but they're also very in tune and aware uh, and in sync with the employees. Hmm. Some of you would say, well, it's right in the middle, but is it really? Well, it's really not. It's because they're really production oriented, so they're way out here, and they're also really employee oriented. If they're in the middle, they're less employee oriented than the ones on the end, and they're also less production oriented. That's a really a middle on both of those. On this dimension, on, on, by uh, envisioning it this way and, and drawing it out this way, you can't really describe a person who's high and high on both of these. Or what about somebody who's just terrible? Where do you put someone who's low on both of those? Well, is that the middle? Well, not really, because they're terrible on both. 
So really, they, they shouldn't be on there. So as, as we began, we, again, the people before us, as we began thinking about this, we said, well, that, I don't know if that makes the most sense. We still like the two the ideas of uh, being focused on the job and the idea of being focused on people. But as far as being able to explain anything other than really high on employee and low on production, really high on production and low on employee, this, this single continuum really, really doesn't grasp it. So at the same time, kind of as uh, Stogdall is writing his review piece, putting it into the trait theories, he and his buddies, now Bernard Bass, I think it was one of his grad students at the time, Bass eventually took over that Stogdall handbook of leadership, which became a thing after that original 1948 review piece and has been published uh, several editions, generations uh, over the decades since then. But Ohio State was doing their own work. And what they did, and I'm going to show you on the next page and described in the book, they came up with a scale called the LBDQ, Leader Behavior Descriptive Questionnaire, where they came up with a whole big long list of behaviors and they went off and surveyed people and said, tell us about the one that you work with. And uh, so instead of being however many, you know, a couple hundred different behaviors, so they're really two. And lo and behold, they're, they're very similar to the ones that Michigan came up with. Consideration. Now, the way my brain remembered this the first time, just think about, isn't that considerate? You know, I've tried to teach my boys to hold doors for people and kind of be aware of people around them, uh, to be considerate of others, just kind of file that away. Consideration behavior is that behavior that's people focused. Initiating structure, getting things put together, getting things organized and structured and moving, that's the task. So the same two basic dimensions, one of them is concerned about people behaviors, one of them is concerned about task behaviors. But instead of conceptualizing it as two ends of a single continuum, they conceptualize it as two independent dimensions. So I recommend that you just do a, do a little Google search on this and, uh, and you can see a graph for yourself, but I, I tried to make one for you right here, which kind of, it's easier probably just to see uh, in the textbook. So on this one, this is Ohio State University, the Leader Behavior Descriptive Questionnaire, the LBDQ is what they came up with. And what they identified was two different dimensions. And let's just get used to thinking about the task dimension on the bottom and the people dimension on the side going up and down, because that'll come back later in the contingency era. So with this, they said you can be low or high, kind of the pushing you out to the ends of this thing, and, and you'll see it on the next uh, model as well. Or, and then you can be high or low on this one. So really we have these four styles and then there's something in the middle. You can be high people and high task. That's the one that you couldn't explain with Michigan because uh, Michigan, that's, that's the opposite ends of the continuum. So now doing it as a two by two graph, you can be high on one, high on the other, low on both, middle on the both, or high on both. So with this one, this is high people, high task. This is high people, low task. Very in tune with the people, not as much time concentrated on the task. This one, I'm low people and low task. Hmm. And then this one, I'm low people and high task. So this is the model. And what they did is they just kind of used this to describe the situation. Now we're going to give explanation to this when we get to the contingency error. They're going to say which style is best, which box do we need to be operating out of? It depends on stuff, but we're not there yet. We're not to the contingency area yet. So this, this is uh, Ohio State. This is Stoggle. It's these two independent dimensions, task on the bottom, people on the, on the vertical, up and down. And so we can vary. We've got these different high, high, low, low, middle, 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 middle on both of them. Uh, you can be anywhere on that. But they, they were kind of wondering, now, what do we do with this? Well, what do we do with this? And so what happened was, and this is also in the book, and this, uh, I was searching around, I went and found, this is the same reference from our book. It looks a little bit different. Uh, but this is Blake and Mouton originally, and then this one is gonna be Blake uh, and McCants here. Uh, but this one, the manage, formerly the managerial grid by Blake and Mouton, there's Blake and Mouton, uh, also known now as the leadership grid. So right here, Blake and Mouton was the original. Uh, the managerial grid, maybe I should have flipped these two after seeing that now became known as the managerial grid, then became known as the leadership grid. The thing with this one are these two notes right here, these last two bullet points. They said, thinking through this, and 
if you're thinking about, you know, what could we do this as a, as a management professor, maybe as someone who leads uh, training sessions, which I do uh, with other people, just knowing those different dimensions from the Ohio State, that's interesting. But now how do you make it useful? And so Blake and Mouton said the way you make it useful is you train people to be what we would regard as kind of the best way to do it. And the best way we can all think through is going to be where you're really high task and really high people. That's the best style. So what they did is they came up with this grid. So on the last image that I just showed you, I had a two by two grid. They Their grid is nine by nine. Uh, so on this one, the, they say the best style is nine nine. It's high people and high task. They called it team management. Work is accomplished from committed people. Uh, the interdependence comes about from this organizational purpose and we trust and respect and we all work together. And then they describe these other ones. So 9-1, high task, low people. This is authority and compliance. This one up here, country club. This is where we're just concerned about the people, but not the job. We're just there to kind of have a good time, satisfy relationship needs, uh, comfortable, friendly organization, atmosphere, and work tempo. Eh, the, getting the job done, hmm, whatever. We're going to have a, a good time and be aware of each other. The middle of the road is here. These are people who are middle on, on task and middle on people. So that 5-5 five, five model. And then down here uh, is the impoverished management. So, so Blake and Mouton was an important model, important step. They took the ideas of Stogdall in Ohio State, who kind of, I think, improved on the ideas of, of University of Michigan. Instead of a single continuum, they then turned it into this two-by-two two grid. But what do you do with it? Blake and Mouton said, well, we tried to train people to be 9-9. But I'm going to ask you, uh, can you see times where 9-9 is not always the best? Are there times where maybe something happens and maybe you really just need to focus on the people for a little bit? Can you think of a time where uh, I can't be friendly anymore? We, we really have to get this thing done today. And so there are going to be times where I need to slide down here and uh, really push on getting this job done. And if I heard some feelings you know, I'll, I'll mend or attend to those later, but right now I have to get this job done. There are other times where I can back off and, and where would that be appropriate? And then there are other times where I'm going to back off altogether. Let the people decide. We'll, we'll, we'll make more sense of that later. So this is Blake and Mouton. I just want you to think uh, that the, the idea that 9-9, this universal style was the best, it got us thinking about some other stuff. And, and that's the next chapter. So this is chapter uh, seven, I think it was. And then, uh, so as far as what I, I want you to focus in on from chapter seven, there's a lot of other stuff in there, which is valuable and wonderful. And I encourage you to read it. But what I'm gonna ask you in our review questions for the week is gonna tap in uh, to what I just showed you there and ask you some questions and how you might be able to apply those ideas. I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter, but what I want you to know is that stuff. All right, chapter four, is, is also in, in this week as well. So I'm just gonna set the stage. I've actually got four kind of splitting weeks. So we're gonna start it today and then we're gonna continue it next week. And really besides defining power right at the beginning and doing uh, French and Raven, it's then gonna talk about uh, power motives, leader motives, and it's gonna talk about uh, influence tactics and strategies for choosing the appropriate influence tactic. I'm going to save those two topics for next week as well. So I wanted to kind of show you this just to get you started in chapter four, uh, to get you thinking about these ideas. And then in your uh, reflection for Thursday, I'll have you identify ways that you see French and Raven's uh, ideas appear kind of in, in your work, uh, in your work life and situations. But before we do that, I really kind of need to set the stage. Uh, the, they do a good job introducing these concepts in the chapter, but, but let me kind of throw my stuff at you too. So leadership uh, from chapter one, right there on page four from chapter one, when they were going through the different definitions that we've had basically, what, since World War I, World War I, all the way up through uh, the 80s and maybe even to the 90s, we, we had all these years of uh, definitions. And the kind of the conclusion was, it's so complicated and complex, uh, that it's really kind of hard to just have one definition that is really kind of good and satisfactory. But for the book, they used the one by Roach and Belling. And you'd have to go back and look in the in the uh, list of references at the end of the chapter to see who that's who it is. But that's who it is. So it's on page four. This is the one that they use kind of at the 
end the, the, of the chapter to say, this is what we're gonna use as kind of our definition when we're talking about leadership. So leadership, the one they chose, the process, so it's a process, it's an ongoing thing of influencing, this is why I'm bringing it up, an organized group toward accomplishing its goals, influencing. Leadership is the process of influence, getting a group to do what it needs to do. So how do we do that? So influence, again, my words, influence refers to change. Change in direction of a group, in the action of a group and individuals, in the thoughts of the group and individuals, and the attitudes. And again, attitudes, the think, feel, and do. So if you can change their attitude, you change the way they think, the way they feel, and, and then it's gonna pour in how they do. So if you think about Babe and, and how the sheep helped change his attitude about them, that then reflected in how we interacted uh, with the sheep, like that really happened, but you can get the idea. Uh, so influence refers to change, the process of influencing, the process of changing an organized group in direction, action, thoughts, and attitudes toward accomplishing its goals. And then lastly, this is why it's so important. When we study leadership, we are studying power. It's all power. And, and the proper power base drawn upon in the proper time with the proper people, otherwise known as the situation and the followers, to bring about optimal compliance and performance. Power, my words, the ability or potential to influence. So if leadership is the process of influence, influence is change, power is the ability to influence. So in order to influence, in order to be a leader, to lead others and to change them, you must have power, social power, all right? So real quick, here's where we're gonna end the chapter. Uh, I want you to, I would really want you to write, uh, dig through French and Raven, and I'm gonna post a little video for you on Tuesday, kind of a little Tuesday, kind of midweek reflection, get you to think about some stuff. I'm gonna give you one on Tuesday after you kind of read through this and thought about it yourself. So French and Raven said, these, these bases of power that have, are available to ones in, in a position of leadership, uh, responsibility, authority, uh, these are, they can, can be broken out into five pieces. And others, uh, Hersey and Blanchard, when we get to situational leadership theory next week, uh, I'll, I'll tell you how they in, introduce some other ones as well. So expert power. If people influence you, if they tell you, if they are perceived as an expert and they tell you this is what you need to do, and you do it, then they've influenced you. They've changed you because of your, their perceived expertise. Referent power. Again, look up the definition. There's a good description. There are several pages of this in uh, chapter four. Referent power is the power of admiration or respect. To revere someone, to hold them in awe, to hold them in esteem. If they ask you to do something, you would do that because of that admiration and respect and awe. If my dad, my father called me right now and said, kid, I need you to do something, I would do it because of that admiration and respect and awe. And maybe because it's also because he's perceived as an expert on some, but regardless, I would do it uh, because I, I revere him. Legitimate power is power vested in the position. And so I'm gonna give you a little thing on Tuesday night. It's formal authority, authority granted to a position. Reward power are the rewards that can be given from that position. And then coercion or threats and punishments also vested in the position. So um, as, as professor in this class and part of the, the leadership uh, instructional team in this class, we can we have certain authority and we have certain rewards and maybe some coercive uh, power bases at our disposal. But that's just in this role as professors. If we ran into each other, if I came to your workplace and uh, asked you for help, and you influenced me, you would draw upon the power bases that you have at your disposal, given the situation in which we find ourselves. So these all vary. Uh, fascinating. It's fascinating. This is a social power, social power, unlike uh, kind of physical power. Uh, so plug something in a wall, put some uh, gas in your car with certain horsepower. That's different. This is social power, and it, it kind of resides and is given uh, from the minds of the followers. And so next week, so as you go through this week, uh, week three uh, in chapter four, really, I just kind of want you to go up through French and Raven. You can keep reading if you want. We're going to do it next week. But if you want to wait till next week, we'll talk about leader motives and particularly uh, McClellan's learn needs theory, which are really good and cool. And I like them. 
uh, and then also uh, influence tactics. And so the, the ways that the power bases are drawn upon to actually get people to do stuff. And so those are the influence tactics. So with that, that is it for the week. And uh, I, I hope this helps. So as you read through uh, the material, uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that this kind of supplements and helps kind of clarify some of those ideas in your head. So that's it for now. We'll be back with more. Thanks. Bye.